good morning, everyone, and um, thank you, Tejas, and everybody who organized this for inviting me. So, a um, little change in gears. So we, um, well, the, I took the liberty of changing the title a little bit, um, talking about coronary, um, chronic coronary syndromes in acute. The, this, this is a term that's favored now um, instead of chronic stable angina, as you know. And the reason behind that is because we've recognized that not all chest pain is from obstructive disease. Uh, and we need to acknowledge that and come up with ways of assessing non-obstructive disease in the cath lab. So the first half will be on chronic uh, coronary syndromes and second on acute. And the, we've, you know, just to highlight the point, this trial's been, uh, or the study has been uh, quoted many times from Manesh Patel, uh, that was from NCDR, a national registry in the US showing that about 40% of angiograms that we do are normal or non-obstructive, and yet these are patients with anginal chest pain or positive stress tests. So we need to th have ways of assessing these patients beyond just saying they have normal arteries. And remember, these patients do poorly. They have worse prognosis than people, healthy controls. So just because you have normal coronaries doesn't mean that uh, you have a healthy heart. And about 5 to 10% of myocardial infarctions are in normal coronary arteries, so-called minoca. So with that in mind, I thought that uh, we'd share a few ideas. This is an ex example of a patient we had last uh, month uh, in our cath lab. He was a 50-some-year-old man who had been having pre episodes. And um, it turned out he was having recurrent VT, so much so that he ended up with an ICD at the outside hospital. And... Uh, still had ICD shocks despite being on antiarrhythmics, and an angiogram had been done that showed minor uh, plaque here, and um, they elected to treat that medically. He eventually came to us for a second opinion, and we, uh, somebody reviewed his chart and noticed that he was having chest pain before his VT episodes and had some ST segment elevation transiently on one of the monitorings, and we wondered if spasm was playing a part, and indeed, to cut a long story short, he was getting spasm on this large, bulky, positively remodeled plaque. And here's a great example of how imaging can help. And this is what we used to call Prince Metal's angina. Prince Metal described these episodes of SD elevation, chest pain with near normal coronary arteries with a mild plaque there. And this is what he, I'm sure he was describing, this normal vessel on the opposite side of this bulky plaque that's prone to causing spasm. And so this, we stented it and his VT and symptoms stopped and no more ICD firing. So spasm is a big element of uh, this Inoka or Anoka patients. And then the other is microvascular dysfunction. You've seen images like these. This is an animal model of the microcirculation. We can't see it, and we're so prone to just working on things we can see and forget about the things we cannot see, and that's partly why we're here today, is to talk about physiology. So physiology is more than just FFR and IFR. So how does the microvascular uh, function uh, uh, is important in the lab? Well, all these mechanisms that can cause microvascular dysfunction. Remember, microvascular dysfunction is not one entity. It's just really a basket of mechanisms that cause the microcirculation to cause chest pain, positive stress test, ACS. And now we've even recognized a HEFPEF and in some cases arrhythmias are caused from microvascular dysfunction. So we need to have mechanisms to um, understand um, the microcirculation. So the learning objectives for this presentation are really to understand the role of what we call a functional angiogram. Uh, again, it goes beyond IFR, FFR. And then we'll talk uh, about what imaging cannot see. We're so focused on, as good as OCT and IVIS is, on plaque burden, uh, maybe vulnerable plaque, maybe calcium, but we can't see inflammation as an example, so we'll talk about the role of inflammation in atherosclerosis. And then some key concepts of which are really relevant to sizing stents and so on with arterial remodeling. We've already touched on that a little bit today. Um, and then some uh, classic mechanisms of plaque which are relevant to imaging. So, in terms of functional angiography, the basis of it is this, that endothelial dysfunction is recognized to be the first step in plaque development. Uh, this starts up when we have uh, any risk factor, diabetes, hypertension, and so on. It causes injury to the endothelium. We know that we can measure this as reduction in nitric oxide and increase in angiotensin on all these things that we've done in the laboratory. And then we see when we uh, bring them to the cath lab that these patients are prone to having vasoconstriction. Uh, we can study further and show inflammation and so on. And we call this atherosclerosis, for lack of a better word. Uh, 
Remember also that in the early stages of atherosclerosis, there's a repair mechanism with EPCs or endothelial progenitor cells. These are stem cells that are derived from the bone marrow. So atherosclerosis is not a one-way process, it's a dynamic process, but eventually as we age uh, and develop more and more risk factors, we can overcome this repair and we end up going down this pathway. So endothelial dysfunction is the key. And I won't show you too many studies, a couple of slides only. But uh, way back in the 90s, it was shown that the more risk factors you have from one risk factor up to six, maybe, the worse your endothelial function was. This is measured with acetylcholine infusion, and there was more and more constriction in the forearm when you had uh, a lot of risk factors. This was as sort of we accept that now, but way back then, this was news, uh, and importantly showed that endothelial dysfunction was relevant to uh, um, to atherosclerosis. And this is the other point I want to make, that endothelial dysfunction is related to prognosis. This is a study from the Mayo Clinic where we divided patients into mild endothelial dysfunction and severe endothelial dysfunction. Patients who had severe endothelial dysfunction had more major adverse events during follow-up. So endothelial dysfunction is not just a um, concept, it's clinically relevant, it's related to the risk factors and it's related to prognosis. So how do we assess that? This is a protocol that we use um, in our lab, uh, and it's been going on for over two decades now, where we bring in a microcatheter into the LAD, put a Doppler wire through it. So the Doppler wire allows us to measure velocity, and if you have velocity and diameter of the vessel, you can measure flow. And that's how we assess the microcirculation, by measuring continuous flow. And we have a standardized protocol. We give adenosine to measure coronary flow reserve. Adenosine, as you know, is a maximal dilator. So 2.5 or above is considered normal. Anything less than that is one measure of microvascular dysfunction. And remember, that's only one measure. Anybody who tells you that CFR somehow can tell you that uh, the microcirculation is normal or not, that is not true. You can have a CFR that's normal and still have microvascular dysfunction, which is why you need all these other steps in your protocol. We give acetylcholine, nitroglycerin, and then measure flow. And a normal response to acetylcholine is dilation with increase in flow of at least 50%. So I just wanted to share this protocol with you. It's by no means widely accepted as the only way of doing it. There are many ways different labs do these functional testing. But this is the most detailed way where you assess not only for spasm, but also the microcirculation by having a Doppler wire in your coronary artery. And this is just one example of a patient recently. This is the baseline image before we did anything. And this is once we give acetylcholine, you see diffuse constriction. This patient had recurrence of her chest pain. We reproduced her symptom uh, and uh, ECG changes and so on. So very helpful in diagnosing what's often referred as, as I mentioned, ANOCA or ANOCA. And also in some MI patients, if you bring them back after they've recovered and do this testing, you can demonstrate microvascular dysfunction or spasm as their me mechanism for their um, uh, clinical event. So, so much so that it's only now that ICD-10 has recognized a microvascular dysfunction. In, as of next year, it will be the first time we'll actually have a code in America to bill for microvascular dysfunction. So even though we've been studying it for decades, it's only now that I think most of the sort of physician population is coming around to the idea that this is a real entity, uh, both acutely and chronically. So I encourage you all to think about that and how you might want to test for it. The guidelines always lag behind, of course, so uh, the current ACC and European guidelines have only given a class 2A recommendation for doing functional testing, but the Covadis group, which is a group of people who are really interested in doing this sort of work, give a class 1 recommendation. So I think eventually the guidelines will catch on and functional testing will become a greater part of what is recommended. And if you are a, a sort of a little skeptical about why should we bother beyond diagnosis, well, I can tell you that it's cost effective. This is a study that's just been published last month from our lab, which showed that the, uh, those who had functional testing had lower cost in the long term compared to those who were standard of care without testing. And the reason for that is pre predominantly that you give the patient a diagnosis, an explanation for their symptoms, because many of them start thinking they're going crazy. Uh, and also you stop them going to emergency rooms and getting admitted. So uh, functional testing uh, uh, is really a cost-effective strategy. So that's really briefly um, what physiology to me means outside of obviously IFR and FFR, and uh, I'm happy to kind of talk offline to anybody who is interested.
in knowing more. So second uh, learning objective is what current imaging does not see. And of course, there are many things I think that it cannot see, but inflammation is one of them. So let's just talk about that because I think that is more important than we realize. So many years ago, this sort of paradigm was constructed that inflammation doesn't just occur in the blood vessel, but it's happening throughout our body in atherosclerosis. And when we have risk factors like diabetes, uh, perhaps the fat cells are the biggest factory of cytokines and eventually that acts all through the liver to produce secondary inflammatory markers, for example, CRP, that are much more stable, and that's why we measure that, because CRP has a great assay for assessing inflammation. And we know that inflammation goes beyond just being an interesting point about atherosclerosis. It actually is clinically relevant. It provides additional information beyond the framing and risk score, or for example, beyond LDL, independent of these measures of risk. And so, um, I teach this to our fellows, um, cells that are important, you'll remember from your medical school days, macrophages and monocytes. Well, imaging is catching up with some of this, okay? This is a nice OCT image uh, of what monocytes may look like. Uh, they look bright and cast this shadow behind. When there's a lot of them, they start looking almost like tikva, where you have this confluent area, a very bright area with a dark, sort of dark area behind it. And so maybe we will eventually have imaging. I just show this as an example. This needs an expert to really see and be sure about what they're seeing, monocytes on OCT. It's not something that we're going to commonly be identifying. But uh, it's really, we're getting closer perhaps to imaging inflammation. So why is it important? Well, this was a study that you may be aware of. This is the Cantos trial that gave canakinumab. This is a monoclonal antibody against interleukin-1 beta and was the first study ever to show that inflammation can be modulated and um, the, in the treatment arm, the event rates were much less. Of course, you had to treat them for five years, so it took a while to show this benefit. But this was really an exciting study showing that treating infl inflammation beyond cholesterol and all the other good things we do actually can improve outcomes. So this drug, unfortunately, had side effects, never got developed. But interestingly, you may know that colchicine has been shown to be effective in atherosclerosis. Two trials that both showed consistently that colchicine treatment in post-MI patients or stable CAD patients resulted in better outcomes. So inflammation is not just theoretical, it actually improves outcomes. So much so that the FDA has now approved this last month as a treatment. Low dose uh, colchicine will be marketed for the treatment of stable atherosclerosis. So inflammation matters, and hopefully one day we will be able to image for that in the cath lab. The closest we have is right now is looking for vulnerable, so-called vulnerable packs or thick, thin cap fibroatheroma. So let's move on to the final learning objective, which is really the air concept of plaque development and how we should be familiar with that when we image in the lab. So this is a classic image of how pla plaque develops. We get sort of LDL. Uh, and then that kind of gets modified, monocytes enter, they become these fat foam cells, and then smooth muscle enters, and that becomes the plaque. That's what we learned at med school. And the classic theory about that is that this is the traditional model, and we used to think that perhaps atherosclerosis just occurred in a linear way and then became exponential in volume as we aged. But in fact, in reality, what we've understood is that atherosclerosis progress is a stepwise prog process. And this is why studies like Prospect didn't pan out to be beneficial because in that they were looking at virtual histology and saying, trying to predict outcomes. And really when you image perhaps down here, uh, your IVUS or OCT identification may not find plaques that's going to progress six months from now. Very similar to why stress tests aren't that good at predicting long-term outcomes because plaque development is a stepwise process. So bear that in mind as we sort of use intravascular imaging for understanding plaque. The other concept I wanted to uh, share with you is the idea of plaque neovascularization. This, again, is not theoretical. It's clinically relevant to us. So this is the vasovasorum blood vessels that feed the, your blood vessel, uh, and they become relevant once plaque develops because th they increase in volume and penetrate right into the plaque. So this is how the plaque actually interfaces the rest of the body. It knows exactly what's going on in the rest of the body. So if you have pneumonia, if you have a urinary tract infection, the plaque knows there's inflammation going on, and this is how plaques progress during those periods of systemic inflammation through these vasovasorum, we think. 
So uh, again, OCT uh, probably is the first way that we've been able to in vivo image these microchannels. These are probably the vasovisorum that we're talking about. Again, takes an expert uh, to really see them. It's not something that we would routinely identify, but if you start looking for them, you will see them. And the reason they're important is because they cause these intraplaque hemorrhages, and it's one of the mechanisms for ACS and for plaque progression. So these are just not incidental findings, but they are directly relevant to plaque progression. Another area, of course, this morning we talked a lot about calcification, and um, you know we will continue to talk about it. But it, I would say that depending on the journey of the patient through your clinic, through your um, a CT scanner, you can use any of those endpoints to plan your procedures. For example, CT is really good at imaging calcium. It just is prone to this blooming artifact and so kind of makes it much harder to see the plaque beyond it, uh, but it can give you the sort of extent of it in the vessel much better than I think we can do uh, in any other way. And then of course you, OCT is brilliant at looking at thickness. Uh, and um, IVUS, if that's what you prefer. And all these criteria have been put forward, and I'm sure they'll be covered in other presentations for calcium. So the key points are endothelial dysfunction is an early feature. Of course, cholesterol is important, but inflammation is very important. Smooth muscles play a big part in the development of plaque, and then the vasovisorum uh, leads to these plaque hemorrhages. Remember that this can also occur within stents, and we'll see an image of that in a moment. But this is uh, something that if there's anything you want to take away from, uh, especially for our fellows and trainees here in the room, uh, this is uh, something that you want to think about because oversizing of stents with intravascular imaging is something that we have to get very um, conscious about and avoid perforations. And this is the reason that occurs because in the early stages of plaque development, the EEM increases and uh, the lumen size remains the same. This is why angiography misses plaque in the early days because that's a luminogram and the lumen size remains constant for a long period in our lives. It's only really later on when the plaque volume is huge that the lumen becomes small and that's what we call obstructive disease. So this is the period of uh, plaque progression uh, and it's the period of what we call the vulnerable plaque. It's this positive remodeling. Now if you measured your stent according to depending on where you measure uh, your stent, you will get different sizes of the vessel, right? So this is why we often get stent sizing wrong. The question is, can we ever regress this? Uh, and the short answer is not yet. Uh, even high dose statins don't regress plaque, but studies with PCSK9 have shown some amount of plaque regression. So maybe we one day we will be able to, that's a common question that patients ask, can you get rid of my plaque? And the answer is of course no, but maybe one day we might be able to at least um, if not stabilize, regress it. So this is the, what I was getting at. So this is how you measure plaque remodeling. Um, here we have a positive re remodel area at the lesion site. The vessel is actually bigger in size than at the reference size. So if you measured your stent according to here, you're going to oversize, and that's why we talk about proximal or distal reference as your site. But of course, remember, there's plaque all over sometimes, and measuring reference sizing can be difficult. And negative remodeling is when the vessel becomes smaller, um, and the definition of it, at least that's widely used, is a 5% change compared to the proximal reference site. So positive remodeling is the reason why oversizing can occur. So let's move on to acute coronary syndromes. Uh, the classic understanding has been that majority are due to rupture um, and then the rest are due to erosion. But we have recognized that not calcified nodules, as we talked in our life case, are important uh, for ACS and um, intraplaque rupture, the, uh, or hemorrhage, sorry, is what, another mechanism that we just talked about. So this is our classic understanding of ACS for type one myocardial infarctions. OCT, of course, gives you these beautiful images of uh, a ruptured plaque. And uh, more importantly, though, I think we've got much better understanding of erosions from OCT, I think, than we ever, ever had. Uh, and uh, uh, let me just show you an image of that here. This is what erosions look like. So you have an intact plaque with these sort of slight um, blebs on top, which is thrombus. and um, with an in, no evidence of any rupture of the plaque. And this uh, uh, is uh, the classic appearance. And with these OCT studies now, we're beginning to think that in fact, erosion may be more important or more common 
then we've realized, and even calcified nodules may be more common as mechanisms of ACL than ACS than we have recognized in the past. So imaging is really adding to our understanding of the pathophysiology of ACS. And uh, if you divide patients into STEMI versus non-STEMI, it seems that erosions are more common as a mechanism of non-STEMI. So I think as we do more and more imaging over time, we will really uh, improve on our understanding. And this is not, again, theoretical. Uh, there are potential impact of this for treatment down the road. Some people think that erosions could possibly be treated without stents in STEMIs, for example. Now, of course, we don't have evidence for that, but again, at least once you start seeing things, you can start thinking about how to treat them differently. So what, uh, you know, what do we know about plaque erosions? The short answer is not a lot in terms of the pathophysiology. We know they may occur in younger patients, diabetics. Uh, they don't seem to have inflammation. Uh, so it's a really distinct entity to what we typically think about atherosclerosis. We've talked a lot about the calcified nodule. This is probably the best paper on the topic. Uh, they systematically looked for nodules and found that uh, these were common in older individuals. There was no gender difference, more common in diabetics and chronic kidney disease. And it coexists. It's not an isolated finding. Calcified nodules really are one point in a patient's vessel. So there's a lot of calcium usually on either side of nodules, as we saw in today's case. Um, um, so it has clinical implications, but it can cause an ACS as well. This is an example of a relatively simple nodule. We talked some, uh, about some more complex ones. This is in the left main in a case that we saw recently. Here's an example of instant plaque and neoatherosclerosis. We used to think that instant was mostly restenosis and a benign thing. We now recognize that about 15 to 20 percent of restenosis actually presents as an ACS, and that's because of neoatherosclerosis. And it looks exactly like classic neoatherosclerosis. There's lipid in there, there's uh, plaque uh, rupture, and so on. Um, one of the things that we realize is the, uh, that for bare metal stents, this neoatherosclerosis occurred much later. So the patients that we saw you were coming back 5, 10, even 20 years later with this sort of pathophysiology within their stents, but with drug-eluting stents, at least first generation, it was much sooner because they caused inflammation, and so we used to see this neoatheroma within a year. My feeling is with these current generation stents, we don't see a lot of neoatherosclerosis, probably because the polymer is much more biologically friendly. And this is just an OCT example. These are tines. Uh, this is uh, a classic TICFA within uh, the stent, uh, a so-called sort of vulnerable neoatheroma within a stent. So key points here about acute coronary syndromes, there are multiple mechanisms, um, four major types that we talked about, and um, OCT is really going to improve our understanding. So that's type one myocardial infarctions. And then of course, as you know, type two is the current way of thinking about uh, MIs that are not due to um, thrombo, uh, uh, um, thrombotic mechanisms. And this is just a great example of SCAD where you see uh, Tejas, is this something you see much, SCAD here? You do? So um, this abrupt uh, difference in caliber uh, with a normal vessel everywhere, we think of this occurring in middle-aged women. Um, and when you do OCT, and that's really why I wanted to show, is again, intravascular imaging is really helpful here if you're not sure. In general, you can diagnose SCAD from just the angiogram. Uh, and there are some potential risks of wiring these vessels, but certainly you get these beautiful images of the uh, hematoma within the vessel, and is really uh, nothing else looks quite like it. So um, um, that's a kind of a whirlwind tour through um, how the interface between sort of uh, our understanding of basic uh, pathology and how that interfaces with imaging and how imaging is going to really feed back and improve our understanding of atherosclerosis. With that, thank you very much for your attention. Hello. Hello. Uh, yeah, it was an excellent uh, talk, uh, Abhiram, and you uh, touched the important topic so well. Uh, any question from the participants uh, or the faculty? Yeah. I, uh, it was an excellent illustration of both ACS and CCS. I uh, just wanted to tell, sir, when do you choose uh, 
especially when we are going for a physiological assessment, uh, a hyperemic versus non-hyperemic indices. Okay, so in obstructive plaques, you mean? Yes. Um, well, we'll cover that tomorrow, but I think, um, so, I, you know, I think generally we've gone towards non-hyperemic, um, mostly because of convenience and speed. Um, there are situations, you know, we used to, for the first few years that we did uh, IFR, we would do both. And once we got comfortable that we were really seeing similar data, we switched to doing IFR. So, you know, should we do both? I think if whenever you're sort of, I, I tend to do both whenever I think I need both data. But there is no systematic way where I'm doing both. I've, we've really switched mostly to IFR now. And uh, a sim uh, another question. Do you, do you find any, uh, any clinical indicators of getting the diagnosis of plaque erosion clinically? Could you just repeat the question? Clinical indicators of plaque oh, erosion. Oh, clinical indicators. So I think, no, it's not that easy. I mean, like I said, there's a slight correlation with certain risk factors, diabetes and so on, but um, not really. I think unless you image, you're not going to know. And that's why I think imaging is really shedding a really good light on the pathophysiology, because we always equated it to plaque rupture, all, all yeah. our sort of STEMIs and non-STEMIs. Yeah. So but before, before this uh, one OCT, uh, yeah. Yeah. only one yeah, question. Yeah, this is the reason my experience with our 45 years old gentleman who came with mild effort angina, TMT was strongly positive at a lower workloads and he was a reformed smoker, non-diabetic and uh, hypertension, he had a history of bile but he became normal. I did the angiogram. The angiogram showed ectasia of both systems and slow flow. But here my doubt is what made him to go for a positive TMT. Now, is it a associated microvascular dysfunction in such a case, how to manage? Ectasia? Yes, yeah, yeah, ectasia. Yeah, so uh, you know, we're seeing more of that over time because we're doing more imaging. Um, there is no you know, there's not even a good study on ectasia that you could quote. So the, it's a good question. Uh, and yes, you're right, the microvascular dysfunction is associated with ectasia. It's uh, not widely recognized. How do you treat? Well, you know, we, we sort of extrapolate to, from what we do in other areas. I, don't, I can't say, well, this is specific for ectasia. But what we know is it's not just effort angina, but they actually present with MIs too. Uh, and so I think careful risk factor management and then treating their symptoms like we would other situations of microvascular dysfunction. But I'm not aware of any specific therapy that really targets these ectasia patients. It's a great area for study, uh, but yeah, Thank we need more you. information. Thank you, Abhiram. Thank you for an excellent talk. Sir, just one question. Just, I'm sorry, just one question. Um, sir, you discussed about imaging of uh, ACS, particularly erosions versus rupture. So oftentimes uh, we have heavy thrombus load in those in STEMI patients. How do you prepare these patients before imaging? Because red thrombus, the vessel is not uh, very well seen. So how do you assess? The, how do you prepare before imaging? So do you use thrombus aspiration or do you use a balloon? And uh, what is your fear? Say you use a balloon and it causes a dissection or a plaque may rupture because of balloon dilatation. So yeah, what is so your method of preparation? <laughs> so that's a good question. You know, I mean, I think during STEMIs, we're much more in a rush to get the vessel open and so on. So I think low pressure inflations is the way to go. So you do the minimal damage, you know, and aspiration. Uh, but again, aspiration has gone out of favor with all the guidelines and clinical evidence. So I think I don't have a specific way. I think it's more about recognizing when you do the imaging what you're seeing. Um, but uh, certainly high pressure inflations I would avoid because that really disrupts uh, what you're going to see, you know, and you're never going to detect the erosions and the uh, sort of plaque ruptures. So I don't have a specific mechanism I can say to you that, I, you know, a protocol that I follow, maybe the others have uh, in terms of how to optimize the imaging. Maybe they just you do routine imaging, maybe you'll be able to add to that. Yeah, we are going to discuss uh, the, yeah. this area during our panel discussion, yeah. which is going to be extremely interesting. So thank you. Thank you, Abhiram. Thank you very much. Uh, the, the next speaker is going to be Samir Pancholi. Uh, Samir is the one, uh, you know, who has been my friend since 1981. And uh, he has been, uh, I think he is the one who has practically taken part and, you know, positively contributed in every single trico. 
till now. Yeah, this is the 17th one. And he will Thank deliver you. a very basic talk on how I incorporated IVAS in my pra practice. Over to Sam. Thank you, Tejas. Uh, I'm truly honored to be here at the inaugural uh, session of Trico Physiology and Imaging. Uh, this is our uh, new endeavor. We started with transradial access, and as you can tell by the choice of our domains, the focus is on PCI safety. And so first we cleaned up the access site related problems, and now our hope is to popularize imaging to a point and make it easy to use for every operator, clarify it so that we can improve the outcomes of our procedure uh, in a much larger population. Uh, my task is to give you an idea of the very basics of imaging. When I started to learn imaging, right when I was a fellow, IVAS was around, uh, we had an idea of what we are looking at, but really had no data on what it meant and how we used in our treatment. Uh, the industry actually knew more about us, about it, than we did. Uh, and I find that true even today, is that in, in the United States especially, where I practice, uh, the, the physicians rely a lot more on the industry representatives in interpreting the data of imaging and frequently agree because they don't understand what's going on. And not that it's inherently bad, and not that every industry representative is less informed than us, but after, uh, you know, after all, we do have a better understanding of anatomy, physiology, and outcomes, et cetera. And so it's, it behooves upon ourselves to know everything in detail and more about it. So let me kick off, uh, I have no relevant disclosures in this space. Let's ask the question, why imaging? And I'm gonna focus mostly on IVAS, uh, because that's what I do majority of the time. Why IVAS? What does it add to the angiogram? Well, we all know that it gives us an idea of lesion or plaque characterization, and also gives us a very good idea of vessel sizing. So we'll focus on these two issues in a very basic format. Sizing. Well, we all grew up uh, in the interventional training, learning how to size vessels with angiography. It's semi-quantitative. Eyeball sizing is the most common way of sizing vessels, even though quantitative coronary angiography has been around for several decades. The reason being QCA uh, does not reflect the size that we eventually end up finding interventionally to be optimal. So eyeball sizing is what angiography has taught us to use, and we all become very good at it. So majority of the time, your guess of the size is very, very close to the real size. Now, why image at all then? Well, the fact is angiographic sizing is frequently not on the ball. The vessels are differently sized. Most of the time they are underestimated in size by angiogram, and sometimes we overestimate them. Let's look at some data for that matter. This is an interesting study in uh, International Journal of Cardiology from two years ago, where a phantom was used and different intravascular sound catheters were used to measure the phantom. Well, obviously the phantom, we had the exact diameter available to us. And as you can see, with the IVAS catheters as shown in these uh, ellipsoids here, uh, the IVAS, if you may, overestimated the size by about an average of 0.1 millimeters. So if you're worried about 0.1 millimeters, you would say, well, IVAS is an overestimating entity. But to me, this sounds like a very close approximation of the true size, which I think angiography is not able to estimate. Now this is a study by Dr. Akasaka and his group, Kubo et al., uh, from a few years ago, where they uh, also published their experience with an actual phantom lumen area versus IVAS versus OCT. And they found that IVAS estimates the area 8% more than what the actual phantom area is. 8% amounts to 8% millimeter square wise amounts to be a 0.1 millimeter or so increase. 
So, uh, and this is IWAS versus QCA. Uh, in the core labs, QCA is used. And if you look at the core lab data and see where QCA matches up with IWAS, again, there's a 9% overestimation or larger area calculated by IWAS compared to QCA. So it's already confused you enough probably by now. What does all this mean? We are saying that IWAS is better, but then we are saying it overestimates. So for us to remember IWAS versus reality, this is a case from about a month ago in my lab, and this is a six French guide catheter imaged by the IWAS catheter on a pullback. It is supposed to be a two millimeter internal diameter. And by several repetitions of measurements, these were the numbers we got. 1.7, 1.8. So again, we are dealing with ballpark figures, but the truth is imaging gives you a better assessment than angiography any day. By how much does IWAS oversize? 0.1 to 0.2 millimeters. Does it really, at the, end of the, you know, at the end of the day, make a difference in your outcomes? Probably not. Uh, angiography is clearly undersizes, and so it's better to size vessels with IWAS. We'll talk about how to use your judgment and not just solely go by imaging towards the end of the talk. So let's go down to the mathematics. We all know that we are interested when we image the arteries for the purposes of sizing in two particular measurements, diameter and area. And also we are interested in two anatomic landmarks, the lumen and the external elastic lamina, which happens to be the elastic membrane between the media and the adventitia. So lumen diameter is something you draw between the leading edge at each side of the lumen in a vessel. And I'm emphasizing on this basics because I find, especially in early operators and fellows, that these concepts are not very clear. We measure them diagonally or perpendicular to each other and uh, get the average. Uh, when we go to the EEL, we go out to the black outer lining, as you can see with the points of these arrows, once again perpendicular to each other, and we get the diameter for that. Now the area is done as intuitively thought by everybody by mapping the inner lining of this lumen, so to say, in the red circle. And the area of the EEL is done at the margin of the black external elastic lamina that you see on this image. These are the basic measurements that we're going to use to size and use the sizing of the vessel while we intervene on this vessel. Then we want to generate an area stenosis, and this is going to help you a lot in choosing the landing zone. So we get the EEL area, and we get the lumen area, and we calculate the fraction of, if you would, stenosis created by this particular padding between the two circles. This is shown at the lesion site. We are looking at uh, the EEL area and the EEL, I mean the lumen area, and then we are calculating the black diameter there. The first thing I would advise is, as many times as possible, please do a pre-procedure imaging study. When we embark on imaging, our natural tendency is to use angiographic assistance, intervene on the vessel, and then do IVUS or OCT after we have intervened. Most of the money is in the pre-procedural imaging. You can get so much more information about sizing about character of the plaque, which were the two domains that we talked about. How do you start with pre-procedural IVUS? Well, obtain a circular outline distal to the lesion uh, and see what that area looks like. Choose a landing zone. The definition of the landing zone is less than 50% plaque burden by area stenosis. This sounds like a pretty liberal uh, number, 50% is a lot. Uh, we tend to use a little bit less than that because it gives you better outcomes, but the guidelines or the consensus documents recommend the landing zone to be defined as less than 50% area stenosis. We 
just learn how to measure area stenosis. Uh, once you have the landings, and you know, this is how we calculate the, the, the area stenosis. EEL area, lumen area, divide the lumen area by EEL area, and whatever percentage you get is your area stenosis. That should be less than 50% for choosing the landing zone. Uh, measure the lumen diameter at the distal landing zone. Now, lumen diameter versus EEL diameter is a matter of discussion. And if you have 50% or less plaque burden, those should be fairly close to each other. Especially if you have 30% or less plaque burden, they are very, very close to each other. So it becomes a moot point. But if you don't, you have to consider that difference. How to derive the distal reference lumen diameter? Well, very intuitive again, we get perpendicular diameters and we average them and you get your diameter of the distal reference lumen. This is the most preferred or recommended method by the consensus documents. Uh, and again, it's the reference lumen at the distal vessel, at the landing zone. Now let's say that you're not able to find a good landing zone. It's a diffusely diseased artery. Wherever you go, there is high plaque burden and the best you could find is a 50% which you don't like but you have to use anyway. In that case, you can use the EEL to EEL diameter as your sizing diameter distally. And this happens to be the most aggressive way to size a vessel and you have to keep that in mind so that if you have a choice to make, you go lower in that. Now stent sizing or pre-dilatation balloon sizing Take the distal reference diameter, and if you're using the lumen diameter, then add quarter size to it, and that becomes your device or balloon or stent diameter. So if you're using the distal reference lumen diameter, emphasis on the word lumen, then quarter size up. If you're using the external elastic lamina diameter, then quarter size down, or subtract 0.25 millimeters. I'm going through these basics because I want to create an algorithm in, the, in our heads that we follow through every case, even though it sounds very intuitive. The next thing you look at in your pre-PCI IVUS is the plaque characteristics. Now, plaque characteristics, you can write a book on it. So does that mean you go through the textbook every time you do a pre-PCI IVUS analysis? And the answer is probably not. You want to look at the big blocks here. And the most important aspect of the plaque characteristic that we want to learn is calcification or no calcification. And if calcification is yes, then how much calcification? The general characteristics of plaque are calcified, which means echo dense edge on IVUS with shadowing behind. And it's usually expressed in the IVUS world into degrees. We're not able to measure the thickness. There is also fibrotic plaque, which is full thickness, uh, echo density, which is high, with no shadowing. And then the lipidic plaque, which is echolucent, with sometimes a echogenic membrane at, towards a lumen. The bottom line is, if you're not calcified, you could be the other two. And from a device choice standpoint, it really is not going to make a difference in most cases. Calcification does matter. Why? Because stent expansion is hindered by calcification in a very, very big way. So how do you use semi-quantitation to your advantage? Well, this is a study by Zhang with Gary Mintz's group where they published a calcium score, so to say, on IVUS to decide whether the, the vessel needs to be modified first with atherectomy. And I would add intravascular lithotripsy here along with atherectomy. But if you have two out of these three characteristics, then you should modify that lesion before you put a stent in there with a device better than just a balloon. So if you have a greater than 270 degree arc of calcium, if you have a nodule or nodular calcium, or if your vessel diameter is less than 3.5 millimeter, each one of these characteristics give you one, one point on the score. And if your score is two or more, you should do some sort of plaque modification beyond just balloon angioplasty, which means do an atherectomy, either rotational or orbital, 
uh, or do IVL if the balloon can be delivered without trouble. So now you chose your stent based on our sizing algorithm and you deployed the stent and post deployment IVAS, what do you do? Well, the number one endpoint in stenting is stent expansion. From the original days of Antonio Colombo and his teaching about intravascular ultrasound, which actually led to the current status of stenting. You know, for those who are old enough to know, when we used to put stents when they came out, we used to give Coumadin to everybody because with Coumadin, our stent thrombosis rate was five to six percent. And it was not till Antonio Colombo's pioneering work that we found that we were under deploying majority of the stents. By the way, the recommended atmospheric pressure in the stress trial for deploying a Johnson & Johnson stent was six atmospheres. So you can imagine how much under deployment was going on. And it was Colombo who did IVAS and taught the world that the minimum pressure required to properly deploy a stent is 14 atmospheres with a properly sized balloon. And how did he decide proper? He decided proper by external elastic lamina diameters. Now, in some cases, that was grossly oversizing the balloon uh, for that vessel. And so his technique had a very high perforation rate. And we have now ended up with a middle of the line somewhere with a happier marriage. But the bottom line is stent expansion is the number one most important endpoint. It is a predictor of stent thrombosis and restenosis. So we are all looking to expand the stent properly. What is proper stent expansion? The proper stent expansion definitions are minimum stent area greater than distal reference lumen area is one of the definitions. Obviously, that means the stent has to be uh, bigger than the, the lumen itself distally. And this is why the original recommendation with the Palmer Schatz stent was 1.1 to 1 sizing of stent. Well, we were never achieving it with the Palmer Schatz stent when we deployed it with that method. The minimum or the bare minimum definition is an MSA of greater than 80% of the average diameter of the vessel. Now these are very confusing terms and this is why imaging has been in such a gray zone because we have not made this black and white. So again, we, I would forget about the complexities and different definitions and remember that if your minimum stent area is greater than 80% of that part of the vessel, then you are properly expanded. If you choose your stent properly, the minimum stent area should match with the diameter of the stent mentioned on the box. So how do you measure minimum stent area? Well, you put your dots around the periphery where the stent struts are and you get an area and then you get your proximal and distal uh, reference lumen area, which should be fairly close to the EEL area because you chose the landing zones which are less than 30% or at the worst, less than 50%, and the MSA should exceed 80% of this average. That is the definition of stent expansion. If you learn one thing from this lecture, this is what I would want you to take home with you, is what is MSA and what is good stent expansion. Majority of the interventional cardiologists dabbling with imaging are more worried about apposition. We are all taught that if your stent struts are not in contact with the EEL, you're not properly deployed. Well, how many people would agree that malaposition means stent struts not in contact with EEL? Let me see you raise, uh, in a raise, raise your hand if you agree. It's a trick question, so nobody's raising their hand. It is wrong. Malaposition means there's presence of lumen with blood flow between the stent struts and the intimal outline. And this is where I think we will save ourselves from trouble when we have large plaque burden or positive remodeling and we don't chase it till we hurt the patient. So malaposition. Now interestingly, malaposition has been oversold. It is a, a fairly poor predictor of stent outcomes, even though we believe that malaposition is the reason why stents clot and stents restenose it really is not as powerful a predictor at all as stent expansion is. 
So mala position, as Ankush had said in the previous case, uh, proximal mala position is very important because it prevents you from getting back in in the future. But otherwise, nobody is saying you should ignore it, but it's really not the best predictor. So if you have mala position, you should make an effort to uh, reduce that or eliminate that, but it's not as important as, as stent expansion. It, and this is a good example of malaposition show, shown by one of the brand name techniques called chroma flow, where you can see the blood flow outside the stent lumen uh, between the intima and the stent. Now let's talk a little bit about remodeling. You know, Glagoff and his group taught us that the typical uh, model of atherosclerosis is vessel expansion as plaque volume increases and then followed by lumen constriction as the plaque volume further increases. Before that, with Bill Roberts' theory, we were all imagining the vessel as a plastic tube and as you grow plaque inside it, it just narrows the lumen. Well, that's not the case. The nature is much more forgiving and so the EEL actually expands. So to measure this properly, the imaging pioneers have created a remodeling index. What is remodeling index? And just look at the bottom highlighted bold letter line, forget the top. The remodeling index means the lesion EEL cross-sectional area divided by the average EEL cross-sectional area proximally and distally. Tells you what is the EEL area compared to the reference area average simply speaking. So if your lesion EEL area is less than 95% of the average of proximal and distal cross-sectional EEL area, you have what is called negative remodeling. In the balloon angioplasty days, this was a very strong predictor of restenosis, predominantly because of recoil. Right now in the stent area, in, in the stent arena, you know, uh, era, I believe it's a you know, predictor of perforation and so still becomes a poor predictor of outcome or, or a predictor of poor outcomes. Positive remodeling, which at least in the Western world is a lot more common than negative re, uh, remodeling, uh, is when your, your lesion EEL area is more than 5% uh, uh, you know, higher than the reference EEL area. It needs to be considered when you're post dilating the stent, one should avoid expanding the stent to the EEL in positively remodeled areas because you will over expand the stent, maybe fracture the stent and embolize contents and do all kinds of bad things. Uh, if your target st uh, st minimum stent area is greater than 90% of reference lumen area, we leave these positive remodeled areas alone. Also, it's recommended to cover the positive remodeled segments to avoid landing the stent edge in it. So it is important to identify positive remodeling and negative remodeling. And these are the definitions. So let's summarize or at least switch to what we do in our lab. Uh, we systematized our IOS protocol a few years ago, uh, trying to eliminate as much noise as we could both to increase efficiency and uh, also to, to improve speed. So locate the distal landing zone uh, and proximal landing zone as we defined it by less, less than 50%, we take less than 30% area stenosis. If you have co-registration, use it because it makes life much easier. If you don't, then we Fluoro save our IVAS catheter in those locations and geographically so that we can see where we are landing by injecting a little bit of dye and saving the fluoro loops. Calculate the distal and proximal reference lumen diameters and reference lumen areas because you're going to use them in choosing your size of the balloons and stents which are expressed in diameters and your minimum stent area which is expressed in millimeter square or area. So you need to calculate both of those upfront and have your technicians or your nurses record that on a board. Image the intervening vessel segment. This is what's going to give you an idea of your lesion characteristics, calcium, echolucency, remodeling, etc. And then if you have automatic pullback, you might get a length idea. Or if you don't have automatic pullback, you will have markers on your IOS catheter which will give you a length idea. So now you can pick your 
device precisely by using these numbers. You can choose the diameter and the length. If it's calcified, you need to worry about it. Use the calcium score. Modify the plaque using this calcium score if it exceeds two or more. And if it does not, then you can go with your balloons, either compliant or non-compliant. I like to use compliant, I'm sorry, non-compliant balloons nowadays more than ever. Uh, if the fibrotic plaque, non-calcified plaque, is at an ostium, we frequently use a scoring balloon. And then we use NC balloons otherwise. Uh, the pre-dilatation balloon choice and the stent choice, as we said, if you're using lumen diameter at the reference segment, add 0.25. If you're using EEL, subtract 0.25, and that gives you your reference lumen uh, or your device diameter. Once the stent is deployed, we borrowed this from the OCT literature where we divide the stent into two halves, proximal and distal. And we treat each half in the, as an individual stent. We post-dilate the stent to the reference EEL diameter in that segment. So for distal, distal EEL diameter. For proximal, proximal EEL diameter. Post-dilate it. And then after that comes the second IVAS run. In the second IVAS run, our specific locations that we want to examine are the distal edge, where we spend some time because we have manual pullback. And then we bookmark on the IVAS every single area of the stent which we think is narrower than we want. Call, you know, so visually suspected minimal stent area, both halves of the stent. Uh, we always l inspect the longitudinal display of the IVAS at the bottom of the screen to assess for more underexpanded stent areas. Calculate the minimum stent area at the bookmark locations, and then start calculating if you are having your minimum stent area, which is greater than 90% of your distal or proximal reference lumen area. If it's not at the 0.8 or 0.9, ideally 0.9, but acceptable at 0.8, then you need to dilate more. And we escalate our dilating strategy as intuitively indicated by quarter sizing up with a larger NC balloon. If it is unopposed and there is no positive remodeling, we would essentially post dilate to the EEL diameter at that location of malaposition. So let me go through a case in the last minute or so of this uh, you know, overshoot of time that I have done. Uh, this is a case that I did a few days ago. Uh, this is a man who comes for an intervention of his LED diagonal. And I want you to pay attention to the proximal portion of the LED and see how nice a landing zone it looks angiographically. It looks like I could land a stand proximal to that septal, right? Would everybody agree? Uh, this is the other view of that LED diagonal bifurcation. As you can see, a fair size diagonal. Uh, and we're going to stand from somewhere there to just above this septal based on the angiographic uh, information. Then we do a pre IVUS. So you can see from distal to proximal. And we are now proximal to the diagonal. And look at the plaque burden and the negative remodeling and all the phenomena going on in the proximal LED. And there is no clear landing zone all the way to the ostium of the LED. And now we're in the circumflex and left main. So all that good landing zone that we were seeing is full of obstructive plaque, believe it or not. And this shows how misleading angiogram could be. And this is how we end up with our mace if we go angiographically deploying stents and landing in that proximal segment. Uh, so again, as per our algorithm, the distal landing zone was identified. As you can see here, plaque burden is less than 30%. We measure the diameters there, 2.3 and 2.4. We measure the area there is 3 millimeters square. Uh, we ch we you know, choose uh, our proximal landing zone, which actually is at the ostium of the LAD. And uh, we are going to bring our stent all the way there. And you can see the, the 
plaque burden there, as you can see by the EEL and the lumen areas, 72% plaque burden. But since we are at the ostium of the LAD, we should be okay if we stand up to there. Uh, we diameter size that, and that's in the range of 4 to 4.5 millimeters. Uh, the case was done. This is the angiogram that at the end of the case looked very nice. Everybody liked it. We were all happy. But the one thing I would ask you to do is never get done without doing an IOS, if, you, if possible. This is a very interesting study by Brody where he showed that if you choose a stent, a 3-5 stent, and you deploy the stent at 14 atmospheres, what is the probability that you will have a 3-5 diameter of that stent if you image that stent? Well, 36% of the time, you will get a 3-5 diameter. 64% of the time, you're not going to get to the diameter of the, of the stent as it says on the box. And that is because the character of the plaque is what decides expansion, not the physics on the box that is written on there. So those charts on the box are absolutely useless, misleading, and should probably never be used. If you under-inflate the stent, less than 12 atmospheres, 85% of the time, you have not achieved your size. And so post-dilatation and post-imaging is an absolute must. So in our case, we post-dilated. So we had a 225-18 stent distally, and we post-dilated that to 2.5. The ideal minimal stent area was 4 millimeters. We got 2.7, which was less than 80%, and so we went with a larger balloon and dilated that. Mid-stent... Again, we put a 3.0 by 38 stent and dilated it uh, by a 3 millimeter NC balloon post dilatation. The ideal MSA was 7 millimeters and we still only got 4.4 millimeters. The point is your balloon diameters on the box do not deliver majority of the time. So repeat imaging and optimization is an absolute must. The proximal stent, 3.5 dilatation, 9.6 millimeters square was the expected area. We only got 5.2 millimeters. So we go in with larger balloons and we inflate. By the way, this is the run of the IWAS. So we inflated all three of them and we essentially got what we wanted at the end. Now, I'll show you, because in, for the sake of time, uh, we ended up putting a four millimeter non-compliant balloon in the proximal vessel. And this is how it looked at the end. Final coronary angiogram. If I show you the previous, the pre-procedural angiogram, you would have never imagined that this vessel is capable of, of achieving that size. But this is what it wants to look like at the end of your intervention. And so this shows the power of imaging on achieving what nature intends to achieve. Sometimes we overshoot, but most of the time we do a proper job. So intracoronary imaging is a must. It adds time, but it improves outcomes. Time is added to do the right thing, so it's time well invested. Always perform a pre-PCI IVUS. Use the calcium information properly by using validated scores, etc., and modify the plaque if, and you know, all the time, identify the distal and proximal landing zones properly, uh, you know, and calculate your minimum lumen areas, both distally and proximally. Stent size, quarter size less than the EEL diameter. In the LAD, where there is very aggressive tapering, especially when there are large diagonals, you might have to use your judgment and the you know, my style of judgment is written at the bottom end of this slide, which I'll share. Uh, once you deploy the stent, divide the stent lengthwise into two halves and post-dilate the uh, distal half with the dif distal reference diameter, EEL diameter, and the proximal half with the proximal EEL diameter. The second IVUS should always be done after you're done post-dilating. 
and measure your minimal stent areas. And if you get a greater than 90% minimum stent area, 90% uh, of the minimum EEL area, then you're done. If not, then you optimize by quarter size increasing the balloon diameters. Uh, at some point, you should use your judgment and stop instead of just using the numbers on the screen. And if you do this, I think you will help your patients. I have learned this quite late in my career for the last five years, but systematizing your approach to coronary intervention using imaging is probably the, the final frontier, in my opinion, for making it as safe and effective as possible. Thank you. Samir, it was uh, an excellent talk. Yeah, maybe a time for one or two questions if you have. Yes, hello. Yes, uh, Kiran, sir. Kiran. Uh, sir, uh, how to uh, size uh, the vessel, stand size uh, in negative, focal, focally negatively remodeled vessel? Well, we have normal proximal, normal distal, and focal negatively remodeled lesion. So, up to how we should uh, chase Dilate uh, that. Yeah, very good question. And I think, you know, this is actually one of those unanswered questions uh, in intervention is how to deal with negative remodeling and how aggressively to normalize that segment to its surrounding segments. And I think it obviously, like I said, it's a risk factor for post-stent perforations. So again, that's where you need to use your judgment. Or in my crude English, I would say use your head. And, uh, and you know, everything on the screen is, uh, you know, obviously important, but at some point your decision should trump that. I don't know the answer to that exactly. I would defer to more experienced people like Dr. Akasaka and Dr. Prasad and see what they have to say. Oh, I don't have much more to add, but I had a question for you, um, Samir. You know, you show the areas, the final MSAs that you want, but in ultimate and renovate trials, they use much more conservative final, like 5 and 5.5 MSAs. Do you have thoughts on that? Do we really need to drive our stents as big as perhaps these other suggestions? So you're absolutely right is that, you know, there is data on, uh, you know, areas of 5.5, so minimal stent area of 5.5 as a predictor of very good stent outcomes. And uh, in my lab, I use either one of those schools of thought by convenience. So if in a negatively remodeled area, I have an area of 5.5 millimeter square, I'm going to stop even though it's 70% of my reference lumen area. And again, again, that comes to using your head. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Samir. Yes, so can you suggest any article or book which everyone should read? Read well, if you wait six months, it'll be out. <laughs> we, we realize the deficit. First of all, just let me know if you guys are very hungry or should I go ahead? Good. So now I am going to speak about uh, OCT because uh, nowadays about more than 50% of our interventions are OCT guided. And all, you know, I owe every uh, understanding of uh, my OCT to Professor Akasaka who has been uh, my guru. And... Uh, you know, uh, I'm very thankful to him. I have no disclosure uh, relevant to this topic. Uh, we all know about the arterial anatomy, normal, abnormal, so I'm not going into the detail of this. You all know the different layers. Straight away, OCT, how you interpret high, high attenuation or low attenuation depending on the significant amount of light blocked or maybe it is refracted or bent and with normal artery you will see this type of picture completely you can visualize all the layers including adventitia and uh, with fibrous plaque also if uh, it is not a very bad mixed plaque you are able to appreciate all the layers and with lipid plaque you will see uh, high attenuation and similarly with a calcific plaque borders can be identified and defined because of the low attenuation you can easily identify in the lumen if it is a 
red thrombus, you will see a very high attenuation with a, I mean, and with a white thrombus, you are able to see the, it properly because of the low attenuation. Straight away, coming to, uh, you know, a case I am going to show, and this is what I love to do, always working on the case history and discussion. So a 78-year-old female, diabetic, hypertensive, with chronic stable angina, type C lesion involving proximal and mid-segment in LED with significant calcification, angiocoregistration, and extremely bad mixed plaque with everything, major, major areas of the healed plaque with the predominantly calcium. Rotablator was done after proper evaluation, proposed dilatation was done, and uh, uh, you know, ultimately, the proper stent expansion and with NGO co-registration, everything was confirmed. So coming to the point, what is the influence of calcium on the stent expansion? Calcium is a villain as far as stent expansion is concerned, particularly high intensity calcium. A OCT based, you know, calcium volume index score has already been devised, uh, like angle less than 90 is zero, 90 to 181 and more than 182. Similarly, calcium thickness more than 500 microgram one and calcium length more than five millimeter one. And this is how you are going to measure uh, the thickness, the circumference and the length of the calcium and you score from zero up to four. So, how does it matter? Higher the calcium volume index score, poorer is the stent expansion if you don't properly address it. So what is the importance of calcium plate fracture? An excellent, a small but a very well designed and excellent study done by Professor Akasaka, you know, uh, with o OFDI, that is a Terumo uh, OCT. The, the, he concluded that if calcium thickness is more than 500, less than 500 micron, you can always, you know, b b b b break the calcium using a non-compliant balloon. Otherwise, you have to use a higher modification devices, may it be rotational atherectomy, orbital atherectomy, or intravascular lithotripsy. Because if you have done proper calcium fracture, you give a better minimal stent area and better stent expansion index. So how does it matter? How does better stent expansion index and better stent minimal area expansion, I mean minimal stent area matter? It has a direct impact on binary restenosis as well as target lesion revascularization, 14 versus 41 percent, 7 versus 28 percent, very significant at 9 months, uh, yeah, 10 months. So lesion modification should be attempted to reduce calcium thickness if it is more than 500 micron and try to reduce calcium thickness to less than 500 micron by rotablator or IVL or, or orbital atherectomy or whatever. So these are the few examples, uh, you, know, b b b you know, of calcium, 360 degree, 180 degree, small, thick, thin. Uh, this is the particularly the, the high pressure balloon, you get a macro fractures, plaque modification, high pressure balloon, again big macro fractures. Uh, uh, you can see rota where you are trying to, you know, pulverize the calcium and throwing, throw it in the distal area it will give micro fractures and then you know you dilate it and you get similarly a big macro fractures rota followed by high pressure balloon rota followed by high pressure balloon these are the few examples and these are the, this is a ivl which we are using very frequently nowadays in our lab so you can see the stent expansion index baseline after shock wave and this is the final result. You visibly, you know, uh, it, it becomes good. This is a nodule. This is, we will discuss uh, in, uh, you know, our panel discussion. It's a malignant condition where you can't get most of the time the best, you know, result. But still, uh, again, another example, another example. There are few more examples. So I am just keeping, finish. This is another case, you know, 58-year-old male presented with diabetes, hypertension, and NSTACS. Coronary angiogram shows type C lesion involving proximal segment of RCA. And here you can see 
uh, you know, the lesion with haziness and a long segment, very plucky and looks like a quite a negatively remodeled artery. And here you can see a, a mixed plaque with lot of healed plaque areas and with a lipid dominance. So you are able to visualize the macrophage, you are able to visualize the TCFA, you are able to visualize, you know, the micro channels in the peripheral part. Uh, uh, and what is TCFA? The definition of TCFA is a, a plaque with lipid segment of more than in more than two quadrants, and the thinnest part of the fibrous cap measuring about 65 micron. This definition is also changing when because I am involved as a primary investigator in combined intervention trial and in combined intervene where you know Elvin Cady and others they even Professor Akasaka is one of the, the major investigator in that trial. Uh, the, 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 they have defined the upper limit is 75 and not 65 because 65 is based on the post-mortem study. So before post-mortem patient is alive and it has to be little thicker. <laughs> so that probably is the reason. So importance of identifying the TCFA. TCFA might be easy to rupture and has a high risk of coronary slow flow. The odds ratio is 5. Macrophage, what is the importance? So macrophage is again that lipid accumulation and uh, you can see these are the examples, TCFA with macrophage, usually it is an association, but many times in a very complex mixed plug, you can see macrophage em emits the fibrous and calcified areas also. This is what, uh, you know, Abhiram spoke in his speech, decrease in the macrophage density using Atorva statin. This was a study, which uh, a Japanese study, which was published way back in 2014. They have shown that after treating, uh, you know, uh, for one year, uh, you know, the macrophage uh, uh, with atorva stayed in 20 milligram, the same segment macrophage size reduced and even, you know, uh, you know the, the, the capia has also thickened and plaque has become pretty stable. This is the recent one, uh, which was, uh, the data was published in TCT in 2019, Elirocumab, with rosuvastatin or vis-a-vis -vis rosuvastatin alone and where PCSK9 has been found not only to, you know, increase, you know, the thickness of the uh, fibroma, fibro fib fibrous cap, but also reduce the size of macrophage. So this is going to be a very, very encouraging concept and someday we will be dealing with not only plaque stabilization but genuinely plaque regression part also. The micro channels in non-culprit arteries are, cannot be ignored because these are normally the positively remodeled area or the areas which are gradually uh, increasingly positively remodeled and these are the areas which can become unstable at a later date and uh, you know uh, you have to keep that at the back of your mind. Appearance of micro channels in the surrounding of the culprit in a non-culprit vessel indicates further development of stenosis in this. A few, few, these are the future development of stenosis areas and they are the areas of positive remodeling. I think this, this part has already been discussed by the previous speaker. Coming to the, you know, this important aspect of healed plaque because you can't identify classically you know, the fibrous many times or calcific or lipid or mix. There are areas of healed plaque. Healed plaque, actually the concept has been given by Ranu Virmani, pathologically silent plaque rupture and subsequent healing or plaque erosion thrombosis happening repeatedly and layers getting accumulated one on the other will lead to development of healed plaque. And when you see the background is fully lipidic and you see this area of healed plaque, it is defined as lipidic healed plaque, background peri periphery fibrosis and the healed plaque is fibrous healed plaque and calcium in the periphery and the healed plaque is calcific healed plaque. OCT detected healed plaque is a mar marker of future atherosclerotic lesion progression in the region. And by and large, it is said that as of now, whatever data is available, it is being concluded that it is instrumental for 
not making the patient unstable, but at least significant increase in ischemia driven revascularization. What is the importance of performing NGO co registration? You can accurately identify good proximal and distal landing zone for stand deployment. So, what do I mean by good landing zone? This is a, you know, OCT uh, operator will think this way that abnormal, you know, absolutely normal segment is ideal for deployment. Fibrous segment is acceptable. Fibrocalcific is still acceptable. Lipidic segment is not at all acceptable proximally or distally for the deployment. Why? It is on the, again on the basis of the study done by Professor Akasaka's group, 744 Avrolimus eluting age stenosis and they have evaluated and they have come out with this brilliant finding that lipidic plaque in the stand age segment post PCI was a predictor of, you know, significant increase in the pre, you know, uh, age stenosis as compared to fibrous fibrocalcific. A normal segment practically does not have that problem. Another case, 68-year-old female, diabetic, hyperlipidemic, history of PCI, LED before seven years, recent onset of angina, here the stand distal age ISR, and this is an example again, at the distal age if you see NGO co-registration, there is a lot of fat. Similarly, another example, see in this case, uh, the proximal age stenosis and just concentrate on the proximal age of the stent and there is a lot of fat. So it is quite predictable when you see it and in the afternoon we are going to have one case of stent age ISR and we will discuss in depth about different type of ISR and there are different varieties and how you identify and what is the impact on the treatment. So it is so important to make sure that proximal and distal landing zone uh, the age of the stent is not deployed in lipidic segment and this explains the value of performing NGO co-registration. Identifying uh, uh, and treating the malapposition, again already discussion has been done in the, if the stent struts are in contact with the arterial wall, the stent is opposed. This is how, you know, nowadays because the cipher stent is not available, we have to consider you know, distance of more than 100 mics because most of them are the thin strut stents. And malapposition, when to treat? Whenever malapposition is more than 400 micron, or proximal malapposition which interferes in, with rewiring because there is no significant, you know, the, if the pot is not done, that, that can be a problem. Again, in the uh, panel discussion, we have a great case to show that. Gross malapposition for long segment more than 3 millimeter and malapposition associated with under expansion, they are to be treated. So this is an area of significant malapposition treated less than 200 micron, less than 300 micron, less than 400 micron and with a very short segment and not really in proximal part of the major vessel, you can leave it. But at times, like whenever there is a small aneurysmal sac, sac here and there, you may get 600 or 800 microns short area. And if you try to chase this by doing post dilatation and if you do a stent fracture in that region, you are creating a guaranteed restenosis area in that area. So just leave it. How to decide the stand diameter already discussed and I am not going into detail. I was oversizes versus OCT by 9% and QCA undersizes by 5%. Again, Professor Akasaka's work, OCT lumen versus I was, you know, EEL, EEL or meet this, as Samir has already discussed this. So not going into detail. How to choose, again, if the stent is expanding the lumen holding the lesion close to or greater than the normal reference segment, the stent is expanded. Here, when you are using OCT, MSA less than 80% or mean lupin area is under expansion and MSA less than 4.5 millimeter is under expansion for a major artery. But again, somehow, somehow, after using so much of OCT, I still feel that it does not hold absolutely true for the arteries 
where we are working over here. And we, we are still accepting at times 70% also and sometimes even lesser than that in an extremely negatively remodeled artery. So this again is a cartoon which is a very famous cartoon. We must know that at, at what level minimal stent area cutoff line we should achieve 8 for left main, 7 for carina, 6 for proximal LAD and 5 for proximal circ. This is for the South Asian and the Asian arteries. For Western world arteries, they have increased quarter size in form of 8.5, 7.5, 6.5, and 5.5. By and large, we should try to adhere to this, not all the time, in the interest of the patient. Because these are the areas where you create perforation, you lose the patient. And when patient comes in the cath lab, the first and foremost requirement is patient should go alive out of the cath lab. Again, this is an important cartoon showing, uh, you know, cross-sectional area and diameter comparison. This is an excellent result where we are achieving, you know, expansion both sides 100%. This is again a very fine result. This is a tapered reference around 98%. This is acceptable where it is around 80%. And this is not at all acceptable where you can see expansion of about 46%. About dissection, when to treat dissection, if it is a medial dissection with or without intramural hematoma or more than 60% of the arc from the center or more than 3 millimeter length of the edge of the stent, you have to treat it. So this is the case. You can see this is a medial dissection, a very bad treated. Again, here in a long and see by seeing this never ignore this image because at times this image gives you a tremendously good idea about what you are doing and what you have missed only by seeing this image this is a medial dissection should always be addressed again should always be an intramural hematoma again there is, you know, a different school of thought that to treat conservatively many times. Again, we will discuss during panel discussion. But in our lab, intramural hematoma, when we see to an extent, like if it is involving a segment of 20 millimeter or so, I will take 32 or 38 millimeter stent here and there on both sides so that the squeezing and toothpaste effect will not allow that blood to go further and create narrowing proximally or distally. This is an intimal dissection which can be managed conservatively. Tissue protrusion, it is seen so well with OCT. So what is the importance of seeing tissue protrusion? Because they're dying, they're dilating very aggressively, you are bound to see. But Whenever the effective MLA is less than 5.5 and tissue protrusion area is more than 10% of the lumen, it is major. And if it is more than 5.5 and area is, uh, to protrusion area is less than 10%, it is minor. So if, what is the importance? It has an impact on the mess, the mess and TLR directly. You know, you in, that there are higher chances of TLR and mess if you are keeping a major tissue protrusion as per the recent studies. These are the minor protrusion. This is another cartoon which is always a very handy for any uh, OCT operator. You should be having it. About ISR, because of the lack of time, I am not going to discuss in detail, but we are going to have a great discussion on the live case. But, you know, uh, homogeneous, heterogeneous and layered appearance, this has been described. All this original work is coming from Japan and mainly from Professor Akasaka's place. And nowadays, you know, there is another classification of ISR. Uh, again, a Japanese uh, group, they have classified into six varieties and we will discuss it out. And where, where the drug eluting balloon works, where the stent works and where nothing works. But here, this study has shown that if you do, uh, you know, stand fracture, you are creating an nidus for extremely high chances of restenosis. No ISR, again, this is ho ho homogeneous, heterogeneous, type 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, we will be discussing. I am not going into detail of this. And about bifurcation lesions, this is very important, uh, you know, 
uh, the concept, you know, I, I will just give you one case to before concluding, but proximal crossing, distal crossing, link connecting carina, and link free carina, these are the four terminologies you should be knowing, and you should also be knowing the designs of the stand, except for Zions, which has, you know, the peak and valley design, all other stands have peak to peak design, with, you know, the struts, uh, I mean, uh, the, the link, uh, either straight or slightly angulated or whatever because it it helps you you know deciding the strategy and these are the things which you can also see on OCT in a you know fly through mode and you can think uh, this is what 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 stand has been used before even patient does not have the information Japanese study has shown that distal crossing and link free carina will give great result and proximal crossing and link connecting carina will have a cosmetically bad result. We have now 129 cases of left main bifurcation evaluated by OCT uh, under our belt. Proximal distal we used to do before and we used to struggle but then after few cases we have left. We are simply doing it may it be proximal or distal and one year median follow-up as of now is showing great result uh, despite not knowing whether we have crossed proximally or distally. So this is an example, one case, I mean left main bifurcation, Medina 111, LAD to LMCA OCT run after T stenting you can see it's a proximal middle and uh, distal, but then we crossed it. This was the classic so-called proximal crossing, although it is middle. And LAD to LMCA run. And then again, circ to LMCA OCT run, which shows quite a clean area. And LAD to LMCA OCT run, again, clean circ ostium. Uh, and this is the end result. So thank you very much for your kind attention. It was an excellent presentation. They just a lot of information and very nicely presented. Uh, what do you think, uh, you know, as far as uh, the incremental value of OCT over IVAS? I think uh, uh, tissue characterization, OCT scores over IVAS. Looking at the big artery lumen, IVAS scores over OCT. If I want to work for left main ostium, you know, I will not think of uh, OCT, I will think only of IVAS. If I have to work on left main bifurcation where the left main is size is less than, bifurcation area size is less than 4.5, I will use OCT. And in other area accordingly. But tissue characterization, because you know, we have, I learnt OCT first and then I am learning IVAS. So I am still trying to struggle and there is a lot of struggle going inside my brain. So how to strike the balance, but this is what, you know, I feel. But I would like to know from all three of you, what do you think? Dr. Prasad. I think you're the first person I've heard who's learned OCT before IVAS. <laughs> That's a quite a unique position to be in. But most of us who learn IVAS first, um, it's really about comfort with what you, I think both are fine, uh, the size and there are a few nuances, you know, large vessels, contrast load and all that, but otherwise really it's whatever you're comfortable. You're right, OCT shows you things you will never see with IVUS, although HD IVUS is getting close in some of the ways, but not really the same. So I think it's whatever you're comfortable and get really good at it and use it all the time is the key, rather than which one. Dr. Akasaka, please, if you can give a comment. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, the both have an advantage and disadvantage. As uh, Professor uh, yeah, Patel said, yes, in the, the CTO region, uh, without the flow, we cannot get any image by OCT. Therefore, mm. in case with CTO, I always use an IBAS. And also, the left main orifice and RCA orifice, IBAS much better. But uh, if the size is uh, not so big, uh, using uh, some kind of, uh, how to say, yes, telescope, we can get a clear image of left main through the, the uh, extension catheter. Therefore, uh, it, it depends on the condition. You can choose uh, either one, right? 
Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Sir, uh, <coughs> nowadays we get a uh, lot many patients of STEMI and uh, we have seen that like in my lab we are having HD IVAS, so we are using IVAS especially for those STEMI cases. Sir, I wanted to know, I know that OCT is going to give you much more detailed, uh, you know, uh, as far as the plaque uh, morphology or the plaque modification strategy is concerned, but do you recommend uh, to do, uh, uh, you know, imaging especially for an ACS case? ACS imaging is vital actually, but as, as far as TAMI is concerned, you know, uh, for all those who have started imaging recently, or all those who have started even intervention since, uh, you know, recently or whatever, one thing you have to make sure that you are creating a TIMI grade 3 flow at the end of the day when your, your patient is going out. And for that, even if you have to increase your metal burden by using a longer stand, just simply don't worry. But in the struggle, if you leave, th you know, th thrombus and other problem and TIMI grade 2, you are doing greatest disservice to the patient. I agree with Abhiram that all the trials of thrombosuction have failed, but unfortunately in my lab, you know, whenever I see a yes. lot of thrombus, I like to clean it using my guide catheter sitting either in the distal LED coming out or proximal, making it very clean, getting the bulk of thrombus out of the artery. Because that makes me feel comfortable and that helps me and my patient having a good night's sleep without any problem. But if you are not comfortable deploying deep uh, the guide catheter, then one has to be careful about it and uh, accordingly you have to choose your strategy. Sir, sir quite excellent talk, sir. Sir, there is one question. Uh, though OCT, OCT having best tissue characterization, plaque characterization, but in uh, which condition IVS is superior than OCT? IVS will be better than OCT for proximal, I mean, uh, I mean, osteal and proximal left main area when you are working in a very bad uh, chronic renal disease or acute renal shutdown case when you have to work, when you don't have to use contrast or, you know, uh, extremely unstable case where you want to just simply go in and out and Sometimes what happens is you push your guide in and the pressure goes down and all those issues. So there you can keep your guide outside and work with IVAS, yeah. Sir, how to uh, uh, treat uh, tissue uh, prolapse? That is again uh, second malignant condition after uh, uh, calcific nodule. You try to chase and uh, they bounce back and they come. So just pray God and leave it alone. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. First and then trying to, you know, learn IVAS. Started doing a couple of IVAS but not very comfortable with IVAS after having used OZT. So I would like to, you know, learn from experts. Uh, supposing an interventionist wants to learn both, which one he should start first? They should start IVAS first or OZT first or they should start together? See, you, whatever you start first, you should know both at a reasonable level you know, to become an imaging person. And this is what is, you know, our aim. Why, across the world you see most of the courses and conferences where live cases are done. You know, the commentary is given by the, the imaging experts and the operators are talking something else. Something else means their finding and choosing the stent and balloon is as per their angiographic evaluation, eyeballing. And the, the, the imaging person is talk, talking something different. So you may not be as good as Professor Akasaka in interpreting the images, but you should be at least having some knowledge so that you don't create a major, you know, you don't do injustice to your patient. So why I ask that question? And if, you know, this happens, I can understand uh, Professor Paul, like learning OCT and then learning IVAS, but, but like, yeah, we need you to know both. There is no doubt about yeah. that. But so then if there is an opportunity to choose one and then choose the next one, which one a young guy should choose first? I was first and then OCT or OCT first and start I was? So or both together? <laughs> so, uh, so my belief is that uh, with OCT, you, as you uh, rightly said, that uh, you can characterize the plaque very well. 
so uh, with uh, once you start using OCT, you will actually like we use OCT in all, almost all the cases. You end up seeing the plaque very well. Then when you after one or two or three years when you start using iOS, you will get to know this this clinical condition. So always use imaging with clinical condition, and you know in this clinical clinical condition you will see this kind of plaque. So OCT gives you a better eyes. This is my opinion because this is how we also started doing. We did OCT for four years and then we started doing iOS. So if we, to start with, I think OCT uh, would be better. Last word from Professor Akasaka. Yeah, yeah, you sir, can, can go. I, uh, yeah. yeah, sir. Uh, uh, yeah, Doctor Ankur here, sir. Also, with Ultrion coming in now, what happens is you have the AI which helps you. And because if a young guy who's starting, uh, you know, with the IVS, he does not have to be dependent on, on. And I'm been using the Ultrion because we, I have the Ultrion, and it it gives you such fabulous images, and and it picks up most of the times very well. So for a young guy, he develops an eye for an OCT. His interpretation of the angiogram also also yeah, changes. Yeah. Changes. So trust your brain more than AI. I think at the end of the day, head what Samir says, yeah. Okay, I would like to say yes. Uh, in Japan, we o o often use an uh, imaging, right? And uh, OCD should be much easier to understand the tissue characterization, calcium, uh, lipid, and uh, fibrous, right? So, for the beginner, it's quite easy to understand what really happened in the coronary artery by OCT. But uh, as I already said, left main orifice and uh, the CTO, uh, it might be better. Fibers uh, uh, should be better. But I think, yeah, initially, uh, yeah, it's depend on the case. For example, uh, uh, for OCT, the bifurcation region stenting and also yes. the, the calcium uh, uh, yeah. measurement, uh, OCT may have an advantage. Therefore, you speculate by angio or CT angiography, uh, the calcium leach or uh, the bifurcation region, you can choose the OCT. And then, uh, if it is not enough, yeah. We try to move to IBAS. It's, it's my recommendation. Yes. Right. So these are the points. Again, everybody attend the panel discussion. I have prepared it. I have worked very hard by keeping eight or ten cases. And I am going to throw questions to the panelists. And uh, we are going to have a great discussion about some areas where, you know, I got intrigued during doing the case and something else was seen and whatever. So we can now uh, disperse for the lunch because we are uh, running, you know, uh, behind the schedule. I mean, I will request you guys to come back by 2 o'clock so that we can start a live case. Samir is going to show again a calcium management case there live and followed by one case I will be showing a ISR case and then Professor Akasaka's uh, excellent talk on holistic view and then panel discussion. So we have a very exhaustive program for the afternoon. Uh, sorry for being late in the program because we are getting little late. So just curtail some time from the lunch and have a quick lunch and get together. Thank you.